one of the issues that we have is a lot of the oils going forward, we've been told, in the medium term and longer term, are going to be heavy, sour crudes. Now, obviously, you can't run heavy, sour crudes in your car. So one of the things we do is we hydrogenate the oil. And for that, the input is natural gas, which also has a high energy, higher energy density than crude oil. So once natural gas production peaks, you'll likely see a rapid spike in natural gas prices, which will affect the economics again of um, heavy oil application. <coughs> and this is a map of the shale gas fields in the US. You can see they're absolutely gigantic. The resource base is immense, whether it's oil, gas, whatever, mineral resource we want to discuss. The resource bases throughout the world are absolutely immense. The issue is, what is the reserve base? And the reserve base is basically the amount of material you can get out the ground at a net energy profit. <coughs> and that should be very high to get a, keep a complex civilization going. We've, we've seen figures of 10 quoted by Charles Hall that, that Chris mentioned earlier. Now this figure is the decline rates, um, I pulled this off the oil drum, it's the first year decline rates of certain US shale gas fields. And you can see they're extremely high, 60%, some even go up to 80%. And that affects, officially we discuss it in terms of monetary values. What is the sort of return on investment? How expensive will natural gas production be because of that? But the really important thing to understand from all this it's the energy return on energy invested. If it takes more than a cubic foot of gas to get a cubic foot of gas out the ground, you're in trouble. In fact, you should really get about a 10 to 1 ratio, otherwise you're going to be in trouble regardless, just to keep the complex engineering systems. So that three just telling you. Now, this is where I'm very thankful to Simon for going through basic microeconomics with you first. I'm going to take a few minutes to describe that. So, this is basically describing the price inelasticity of oil supply and demand. And as you can see, the supply is relatively price inelastic. And then we were in 2007, and you saw in 2008, when there wasn't enough supply to meet demand, the price had to rise at almost a, what's described as a J curve. And you can actually see that in the actual price figures. What happened was, as the price rose that high, it actually rose to the point whereby it crushed demand. There was so much devastation in the economy that demand was destroyed. And when that happened, demand fell backwards to a lower level. And in doing so, it fell very rapidly down this J curve. So you saw a massive spike up, a J curve up, and you saw almost a a mirror effect coming down, and because demand was even lower, because of the sheer scale of damage carried out to the economy, you saw the end price going to what appeared to be ridiculously low levels. And people, are, I know we're used to hearing in the press that there's a sort of uh, a happy price range, say between $60 and $80 a barrel. We haven't had that, and they say, why can't we stabilize that? And the reason is, on supply and demand, they, they meet each other and there isn't much spare capacity in the system, you tend to get these J-curves and they're very vibrant. You can see them especially in the, we've all seen the recent J-curve in the oil price where it went to $147 a barrel, but you see it even more extreme in the gas price. It's a point, this is the non-mix natural gas price in the US and you see how often we're getting these price spikes. We've had the recent 2008 spike and we'll probably build in now for 2000. And, spike. and these spikes going forward will probably get more and more violent as we, as we go forward. Part of the reason is because the world is so focused on reserves as opposed to production flows and energy return on, on energy investment, which is one of the key metrics that we should be measuring our energy flows, which we're not, companies are actually able to book reserves even when the profitability of production example in the shale fields is going down. So they're finding more and more, they're drilling more and more and finding more and more gas. 
But as they do it, because the energy return on energy invested is so poor, the actual profitability of the company is being damaged, but investors don't care. So you get this massive spike where production can go up even when it's no longer effectively profitable. People are just throw money at the company until eventually the whole system just breaks and you get a massive spike. choice that we have going forward is 95% of the world's energy, um, world's transportation is dependent on our liquid fuels. Once gas supplies peak and start to go down, they're going to start taking the marginal barrels of oil down, whether it's tar sands, whether it's natural gas to liquids. As these marginal barrels come down, we're going to go back to this shock point, and you're going to start seeing that but the problem with natural gas is because the depletion, when it arrives, is going to be so rapid, these shocks will come in very quickly, compressed in time. And then you're going to have to make the choices as society. And we'll get to the point where, this, we'll get back to this point where you're going to have to have a choice. Are you going to artificially keep natural gas cheaper, or should I say natural, um, keep oil prices higher than natural gas because your preference is for transportation fuel, or are you going to have a preference for things like, I don't know, food and plastics and electricity? But that's the hard choice that we've got coming. 